So I actually found that a lot of my skills within marketing were pretty transferable into the COO role. Number one, it's understanding your end consumer, your employees, and really listening to what they have to say as you make decisions throughout the company and as you scale and grow the company and build teams. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Growth Hacks, a podcast from TCV where we discuss strategies and secrets to unlocking high growth with CMOs, CROs, and growth-minded leaders. I'm Kunal Mehta, and I'm a principal at TCV focused on go-to-market strategy. And I'm Katya Gagan, principal at TCV and head of marketing. Join us as we bring you the growth and marketing playbooks from technology's best and brightest, and chat with operators as they are in the process of innovating. This is Growth Hacks. I'm thrilled to have Amy Bohutinsky with me today, former CMO and COO of Zillow, a venture partner at TCV, and board member of Zillow, Duolingo, Motsi, and many others. Amy, your career has been highly unusual. You went from journalist to CMO to COO, reporting to boards, and now being on multiple boards yourself. We're so excited to have you today. Welcome to Growth Hacks. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, thanks, Amy. Thanks for joining us. Where does this podcast find you today? It finds me in Seattle, hiding in my bedroom, which is the quietest place in the house right now, hoping my dog doesn't bark in the middle of this. Awesome. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in tech. Sure. So I started my career as a broadcast journalist. And within a couple of years, the first big tech boom was happening in San Francisco. So I transitioned over to doing PR for tech companies. And within a number of years, that broadened to a couple different tech companies from PR into marketing. I was on the ground floor at Zillow when it first started. And over the next 14 years, went from PR to CMO to COO. And then today, I'm on the board of Zillow and a couple of other awesome companies. And at Zillow, which is also a TCV company, you started with a zero marketing budget. Tell us how you made things work. When we started Zillow, we started with, let's see if we can build a household name off of organic traffic. You know, here it was in 2005, we had all been in tech to see this first round of internet companies kind of boom and bust, many of them blowing a lot of money on expensive brand marketing before they had a fully proven out revenue model. And it was a point in time where we didn't want that to happen. We wanted our venture capital dollars to stretch, but we also saw an opportunity to build a company in a really different way, which was to focus deeply on product, product as the absolute best marketing we could have. So yeah, for many years, there wasn't a marketing budget. It was focused on product. And when I was CMO, we probably didn't start spending significantly on the brand until about seven or eight years in and and after we had become a public company. I think the scrappiness and and the growth hack of no budget is amazing. You know, a lot of our companies want to use PR and brand to generate demand, but they struggle with it. How did you guys make that successful? We were constantly asking ourselves, not just, is this what we think people want, but is this something that we think people will talk about? Real estate is such a stress-driven transaction how do we make this fun and provocative and visual and exciting and actually draw out some of the fun of looking into homes and dreaming about homes? So a couple key decisions we made. One was we decided in the early days, instead of just putting a whole bunch of data about individual homes on a page about that home to empower people, what if we boil it down to one number and we give it a snappy name and call it the Zestimate and we visually put that on top of every rooftop in America so that you can come on our site and you can fly over rooftops and get an idea and pop into any single home and say, what's that home worth? This was pretty revolutionary back in 2005 when before that nothing had been online at all about homes and real estate. That's awesome. And as you evolved as a company, what were some of your biggest learnings? 
We did a lot of things well. One thing we did not do well in the early days is we didn't pay enough attention to SEO and the big impact that could have on our business in a category where people are constantly searching in the category of real estate. And it was probably not until about four years in that we started getting serious about it. Others in our category had been serious about it for a couple of years, and we had a lot of years of catching up to do. I see companies make that mistake all the time. After you became CMO, that you then transitioned to COO, which is a little unusual. So what were some of the skills that you carried over from your CMO role and what surprised you? A big part of that role was internally looking at our employees and understanding how do we hire the absolute best people we can, but also how do we retain those people and how do we create a company where people really want to work and feel like they can do the best work of their career and that they belong. And a big part of that is skills that are really relevant to marketing. Number one, it's understanding your end consumer, your employees, and really listening to what they have to say as you make decisions throughout the company and as you scale and grow the company and build teams. So I actually found that a lot of my skills within marketing were pretty transferable into the COO role, which for me was all about helping to scale our employee base helping to retain what was so special about our culture from the early years. And as we made various acquisitions, focusing on a lot of the people sides of those acquisitions as well. That's a good segue, Amy, because Zillow has been very active in the M&A space, acquiring more than a dozen companies in less than a decade. And that included Trulia, which was a 2.5 billion acquisition Tell us about how you made this unusual marriage between the two companies work. One of the things we found in many of the acquisitions we made is that culture and core values really matter in the post-acquisition stage. And those really should be a part of the due diligence. With Trulia in particular, right around the time I became COO, we had just acquired Trulia and our employee base at the time went from, I think, 1,200 to 2,400 overnight. Two companies that had been rivals for many years. And something that was really important, frankly, was just listening to what was important to Trulia employees and then moving forward how do we combine what's great about the two companies? And so one example was each company had a different set of driving core values. We came out with a new set for the combined company the next year that combined both sets and that gave a nod to what was great about both, but also showed that we were bringing two companies together and two different cultures together and creating something new the small things really matter too. And I'll give you an example of this. When Zillow acquired Trulia, Trulia had had a tradition in the 10 years it had been around that whenever a new employee joins Trulia, they get a Trulia backpack. And that was something that was actually very culturally important to the company. People walked around the streets of San Francisco with their Trulia backpacks. Everybody loved these backpacks. And within the HR department, a decision was made at Zillow of okay, well, we have this other package of stuff we give people. Let's just make that universal across the company. And that really upset people, <laughs> the kind of taking away of the backpack. It may seem from a numbers basis or an efficiency basis to be a very small thing, but from a cultural basis, it was meaningful. And it was something that after a couple months of it, we brought it back and we said, you know what, all our different brands can have different ways that they welcome people. Let's let the local teams make this decision and let's not have this be something that comes from corporate because sometimes something small like that can do much more harm than good and can be frankly bruising to people who are already feeling some uncertainty around all of the newness with being a part of a new company. I think that's so important to bring that up. And as you moved into your COO role, you had this obligation almost to drive more connective tissue with sales, marketing products, three groups that often work in silos. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your playbook. Well, one thing that we always believed in very strongly were shared values across all departments. So while different departments may operate under different leaders and different constructs, they all share a common set of core values, which are ultimately how work gets done. And then the other things were 
our product personas or the people we build for. This is another thing that a lot of companies talk about personas or demographics, but at Zillow, we actually had a set of personas. They had names, they had photos, they had a whole life construct. And if you walked into any meeting at Zillow, and and if you walk into any meeting at Zillow today, you will hear people talking about Beth and about Alan and about Susan. And these are individual personas that everyone across every department at the company understands deeply as to who are the people that we build for, who are the people that we communicate with, who are the people that we sell to, who are the people that we market to, and how do we see them as actual individuals. And when you have those shared values and that shared language, and frankly, that shared North Star, it makes it a lot easier for collaboration and decisions across different areas of the company. Fantastic. If I shift your lens over to being on boards, what do the executive team ask you about the most? Well, in recent years, there has definitely been more of an emphasis in the boards I'm on, on the people side of the business. It used to be in many boards that boards talked about financials and business and strategy and the the business side, but never really got into the people. And a really important shift that I've seen happening in the last seven, eight, nine years that I've been on boards is much more conversation about employees, employee mental health, about equity and belonging within the company and looking deeply at diversity stats. I mean, these are conversations that used to be relegated to an HR department that are now across leadership teams, and I'm happy to say across boardrooms too, because this is an incredibly important emphasis that frankly should have been there all along. But I'm happy to see on all the boards I'm on, certainly we spend quite a bit of time on that. But I'm hearing from other board members, it's happening in a lot of places as well. And that's uh, so important, Amy. And I'm glad you're also a catalyst for these conversations. I do hope we'll see more of them across the board. We always finish with a quick fire. So we're going to shoot a few at you. Hey, what's your go-to book? The one that provides you the most value? I read a book a couple years ago. It was called The Second Mountain by David Brooks. At its core, it was talking about the human journey of so much of what you want in life is ego-driven and we all drive up this first mountain. A lot of it has to do with career, things we want in our career that are frankly driven by our ego not necessarily driven by our curiosity or what we'd like to learn or what fulfills us the most. And the crux of the book is about getting to this second mountain. So everyone kind of climbs the ego-driven first, but how do you get to the second mountain where your work and your home life and how you spend your time ultimately becomes more fulfilling and less about the ego and more about what you offer to the world outside of you? I found this book super compelling and it's something that just on a very frequent basis... I think back on in decisions I make and in people I come into contact with, and I find application in the business world all the time. I love that. I read the book as well. And what really struck me, Amy, is what you're saying is you go from that ego-driven mountain to a life that is in service of others and probably ties into the current conversations you have in board meetings that are also aimed at how can you make a team feel healthy and happy? That's right. And it ties into... The broad practice of marketing, which is so much about understanding the customer, the consumer at the other end, having empathy for that person, and then doing your work in service of that North Star and that customer. And I found out there's a lot of parallels in that as well. Right. What are some fun facts about Zillow? Well, one fun fact is that there is meaning behind the name. It may sound like a nonsensical word, but Early days when we were trying to figure out what we would call this, we were looking at two categories of words that were evocative of what we were trying to build. And Zillow comes from the word zillions, as in zillions of data points, and pillow, where you lay your head to rest at night. And it was this combination of data to empower you to make smarter decisions about this important emotional place where you have your family and your life and you lay your head to rest at night and how do we combine the two? So zillions of pillows. 
Fantastic. When you were a CMO, what was the most critical metric you followed? Well, I'm going to say this in retrospect with some wisdom, many years past being CMO. What I think the most important metric CMOs and leaders should follow is employee engagement. The absolute best work you can do comes from hiring and retaining the absolute best people you can. And that data point of employee engagement at your organization, being able to look at that both broadly across the organization, but by team and understand which teams of people and which individuals are happy and likely to stay and satisfied. And when they're not understanding why, that is, I think, the most important metric you can follow any day. And if you get that right, then it's a whole lot easier to meet all of the business-related metrics that you need. And speaking of hiring and employee engagement, what's your favorite question that you ask during an interview? As an interviewer, I like to get people to tell stories. And I like to ask open-ended, tell me about the situation type questions where they have to walk me through a story. And it helps me to understand their curiosity, their different decision points and why they made the decisions they did. But what I want to hear from people is, do they approach problems in their career with the question of what can I learn in this, not what can I achieve in this? Sort of going back to the second mountain, the book we talked about is trying to understand, do they make decisions when it's about them or do they make decisions when it's about broadening their scope of learning being curious about others, and do they see that as a core foundation of leading them to sort of the, their ultimate goal? So another question kind of like that that I like to ask is just tell me the story of your career. And then as they go through it, I'll ask some questions. And there's a lot you can learn just from how people approach that story, what lens they approach it with, and how they summarize the different decision points and the decisions they made. Well, thank you so much, Amy. It was wonderful to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for being on Growth Hacks. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Thanks for listening to Growth Hacks. You can follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. To learn more about us and TCV CEO and founder podcast, go to tcv.com or email us at growthhacks at tcv.com.